C.S. Lewis's published writings comprise some 40-odd books in multiple genres, hundreds of essays and thousands of letters. The theme that arguably rises above all other themes is love, and within the family of different kinds of love, the love of friendship holds prominence. Although Lewis is often credited for accessible writing, there exist a number of popular misunderstandings about his ideas of friendship in particular. Several writers, theologians, philosophers, and literary scholars have leveled serious charges against Lewis's understanding of friendship. This paper will evaluate three of these charges in more detail. I will argue that they are based on incomplete readings or complete misreadings of Lewis's writings and life. This is not to say that Lewis had no blind spots, he certainly did, but that they are not always where his critics see them. Let's begin with the accusation of sexism. It is difficult to read Lewis's early pre-conversion diary, All My Road Before Me, and not be repulsed by some of the things he says about individual women or women in general. He kept this diary for about five years between the ages of 22 and 27. Overall, the young Lewis's pithy remarks about women are quite unflattering. With a few exceptions, Lewis admits, I loathed the female sex. Loathed. This is not mere sexism, but misogyny. The mature Lewis seems almost unrecognizable from the young man of All, Rhyme, All My Road Before Me. Years later, rereading some of his old letters, Lewis is struck, he tells his old friend, by their egotism, sometimes in the form of priggery, intellectual and even social, often in the form of downright affectation. I seem to be posturing and showing off in every letter. How ironical that the very things which I was proud of in my letters should make the reading of them a humiliation to me now. In her study, A Sword Between the Sexes, C.S. Lewis and the Gender Debates, Mary Stuart van Leuven thinks it surely significant that this assessment appears in the letter that also confesses that Lewis has just passed from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ, in Christianity. But sexism or misogyny can exist and persist under other, more subtle forms. The specific manifestation of sexism that I am thinking about, the particular accusation that I wish to defend Lewis against, is a two-pronged prejudice against Lewis's views of friendship between the sexes. First, that he disbelieved in friendship between the sexes, and secondly, that accordingly he had few, if any, female friends of his own. For example, a famous English theologian interprets Lewis's book The Four Loves as a dismissal of male-female friendship. A, an American philosopher thinks that the less said of Lewis's views on this matter, the better. Can men have women friends and vice versa, he asks, and offers a distortion of Lewis's answer. They can, but this is unusual for two reasons. First, men and women seldom have the same interests. They rarely have with each other the companionship in common activities, which is the matrix of friendship. Lewis is further misrepresented by the claim that Lewis believes it is better if women stay in their own circles. These are caricatures of Lewis's real views. In The Four Loves, Lewis does say that historically friendship between uh, men and women has been rare because in the past men and women have rarely worked shoulder to shoulder in common pursuits and passions since home and work were so often gendered. As a result, they had nothing to become friends about. Lewis is here speaking of past and not present conditions. His philosopher critic should have said that historically they seldom had the same interests. They rarely had companionship. This is not the case anymore. The Four Loves explicitly affirms the existence and even increasing prevalence of friendship between the sexes. Where the sexes share common interests, Lewis writes, they can become friends. Hence, in a profession like my own, where men and women work side by side, or in the mission field, or among authors and artists, such friendship is common. Not only this, he continues, Nothing so enriches an erotic love as the discovery that the beloved can deeply, truly, and spontaneously enter into friendship with the male friends you already had. So, not only do and can and do uh, women and men increasingly befriend one another, such friendships even contribute to eros. We are far from the Billy Graham rule.
In Lewis's radio talks on love, he explicitly says that his optimistic view is not universal, that he disagrees with the more pessimistic view, and that he prefers the modern change. There are people who don't believe this. They think that any apparent instance of mixed friendship is usually a disguise for Eros or the beginning of Eros. As a generalization, Lewis thinks this view is wrong. In some societies, of course, friendships are exclusively between men or exclusively between women. Another state of affairs, he writes, which I like very much better is that which we see nowadays in those societies where men and women collaborate in the same professions and have the same tastes. Real friendships can then arise. So much for that first prong. The second is as dull. The evidence shows clearly that Lewis walked the talk and lived by his beliefs. Not only did Lewis believe that friendship between the sexes was possible, valuable, and common, he himself developed several close friendships with women, especially after returning to the Christian faith in his 30s, and especially with religious authors and poets and scholars. And unlike Charles Williams, Lewis remained a gentleman. Much could be said of Ruth Pitter, for example, an English poet, or Sister Penelope, an Anglican nun. Janet Spence, the Fellow of English at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford, Lewis met early in the 1920s when he taught seven of her students. She called his course a great success, and their letter correspondence over the following years is shot through with mutual appreciation of each other's scholarship. Alistair McGrath is thinking of her in particular when he describes Lewis as being blind to gender in terms of scholarship. If Dorothy L. Sayers had been a dick, short for Richard, she would have been an inkling, for she met the two main criteria of passion for faith and literature. She could be considered an honorary member because she befriended so many of them. Sayers was the only non-inkling asked by Lewis to contribute to an essay collection in honor of Charles Williams after his death. Lewis debated alongside her at public events and delivered the eulogy at her funeral. Most astonishingly, perhaps, is the level of intimacy in his letters to her, a level not often reached in his letters to his closest male friends. Lewis writes in The Four Loves that when two who are on the same secret road are of different sexes, the friendship which arises between them will very easily pass into erotic love. A case in point is, of course, his own relationship, not with Sayers, but with the American poet Joy Davidman, although there was nothing easy about that. It started in friendship and ended in marriage. But not even Joy became an Inklings member. Alistair McGrath explains that the Inklings were a system of male planets orbiting its two sons, S-U-N, Lewis and Tolkien. The group had one obvious shortcoming, he thinks. There were no female members. Is this really an obvious shortcoming? Only if we, in principle, object to all forms of single-sex friendships or groups, which neither Dorothy L. Sayers nor jo- Joy Davidman did. It's like thinking that a group of women is inferior to groups that have been blessed with a man. The second charge, or misconception, is that Lewis's views on friendship unduly emphasized uninquisitiveness. Again, the charge is two-pronged. Friends are not interested in each other's private lives, only in their ideas, and Lewis himself remained very private and secretive even in his closest friendships. A hasty reading of the four loves in particular can lead to the first interpretation. This is the key passage. For of course we do not want to know our friend's personal affairs at all. Friendship, unlike Eros, is uninquisitive. You become a man's friend without knowing or caring two pence about anyone else's family, profession, class, income, race, or previous history. Of course, you will get to know about most of these things in the end, but casually, never for their own sake. 
This love essentially ignores not only our physical bodies, but the whole embodiment which consists of our family, job, past, and connections. It is an affair of disentangled or stripped minds. Eros will have naked bodies, friendship, naked personalities. Some of this is witty wordplay with a dash of hyperbole, but modern readers might find parts of it off-putting or insensitive. If joint passions is the most famous characteristic of Lewis's theory of friendship, this, its supposed uninquisitiveness, is the most infamous. Was Lewis not interested in his friends, in their lives, only in their ideas? How could something so unfriendly be friendship? A more careful reading, I propose, reveals the exact opposite. First, Lewis takes pains to stress that beyond the contrast of shoulder-to-shoulder as opposed to -to face-to-face, he does not want the image pressed. The common quest or vision which unites friends, he emphasizes, does not absorb them in a way that they remain ignorant or oblivious to one another. On the contrary, it is the very medium in which their mutual love and knowledge exists. One knows nobody so well as one's fellow. So, friendship uniquely leads to most intimate knowledge and care about also personal affairs. But this knowledge is a kind of gift or prize for having open-mindedly not allowed prejudices to prevent the friendship from arising in the first place. The barriers that exist between people are often artificial and can be overcome by the love of friendship. Lewis also explicitly distinguishes between a friend's personality and their ideas and emphasizes that friendship is rooted in the former. We may enjoy a person's conversation, but they may still disqualify to the title of friend if we are repelled by the personality or character when we get to know them better. Intimacy over intellect. A naked personality is a whole human person. Lewis himself did enjoy a sense of selective privacy, as his student-turned-friend John Wayne argued. There's no point in denying this. Another student-turned-friend, John Lawler, called it the central citadel of his being. Lewis was, according to Lawler, reserved to an almost fantastic degree, at least compared to Tolkien. Lawler evoked the citadel. Wayne used a softer image. Lewis's inner self was as tender and as well hidden as a crab. It seems that Lewis, excuse me, it seems that Wayne and Lawler's images don't accurately represent Lewis's posture with his closest friends. Both befriended Lewis late in life and remained insider outsiders. But even Owen Barfield confesses that he was kept in the dark about some of Lewis's affairs, like his early difficult household background. It is not easy to reconcile the different, even contradictory things that some of Lewis's students and friends have said about him in the various memoirs, interviews, and letters. His early biographer, Humphrey Carpenter, mistaken about the supposed lack of Lewis's female friends, nonetheless notes that Lewis's own feelings for his male friends were so warmly affectionate. Lawler himself admits that Lewis was open about his fears, so even the jumpiest crabs regularly shed their shells. Selective privacy is not, of course, a character flaw, nor does it mean dishonesty. Walter Hooper, the editor of Lewis's thousands of letters, notes that Lewis's father was the only person with whom we know Jack to have broken faith. By definition, selective privacy means selective self-disclosure, self-disclosure being the hallmark of friendship today. Lewis could write the most honest, vulnerable, and daringly straightforward letters. And I don't mean only the famous letter to his wife's ex-husband. To pick one example from hundreds, when his friends Daphne and Cecil Harwood's family was struck with cancer, Lewis reached out. I have nothing to say. This letter is only a substitute for a look or a touch. I wish it were a better quality. I am a hard, cold black man inside, and in this life I have not wept enough. Their son Lawrence, Lewis's godson, notes in his memoir how his godfather's interests 
was in people, not institutions. <clears throat> Many of his most honest and raw letters were written, ironically, given the first char charge to women. And we already mentioned Dorothy L. Sayers in particular. The third and last charge is a suspicion of elit elitism or snobbery. For example, according to the same famous English theologian I mentioned earlier, Lewis's depiction of friendship is intolerably donish, based on a meeting of pure minds between high society intellectuals. Again, a superficial reading of the Four Loves in particular could explain such a misconception. Lewis, re remember, argues that friendship must be about something. As his own interests were admittedly cerebral, philosophy, literature, metaphysics, topics he enjoyed discussing with his female and male friends alike, these are unsurprisingly exemplified in The Four Loves. But obviously, friendship can be about any number of non-academic interests as well, such as stamp collecting, um, which is in fact mentioned in The Four Loves, but missed by his critic. Conversation did not always have to be serious or donish, however, not even in so-called literary friendships. In fact, even the young Lewis considered the inability to chat about mundane things a regretful handicap in a person. His diary records records many meetings with complete strangers. There was no good talk, but excellent chat all the way. Not even the young Lewis comes off as a complete snob or prig. Nothing of much interest was said, but I like both Stevenson and his wife very well. They are thoroughly unacademic. Lewis enjoyed being among ordinary commonplace English people, he says, and defends himself um, pre presciently, I am tempted to say, against the accusation of having an untouched centre. The young Irishman says, In England I am no snob. I can talk with those who drop their H's and like them. It is indeed possible that even sympathetic scholars have missed just how inclusive Lewis's understanding of friendship is, given his era, and perhaps even according to our contemporary standards. It is remarkably tolerant and judge non-judgmental. You do not have to be a wealthy, well-educated, upper-class white man with a spotless criminal history to become his uh, friend. Lewis's radio talk on love support and even bolsters this more magnanimous reading of his inclusive view. There, not only sex and education, race and class and income, etc., but also nationality is included in the long list of things that friendship cares nothing about. Lewis had his fair share of blind spots, peculiarities and pathologies, even about friendship, but any account of his views of Friendship must acknowledge, first, that he believed in friendship between the sexes and he befriended many women. Secondly, that he could be quite open and vulnerable in these friendships. And thirdly, that his understanding of friendship is strikingly inclusive and anti-elitist.